virtually here. Uh, in normal times, we might be together on campus on a, an 88 degree day here in Danville, partly sunny. Uh, we'd all be a little bit hot, um, but, um, but today we'll enjoy each other's company from our own air conditioned spots, uh, I feel sure. Um, we hope we put together a day that will be valuable to you, not just as an introduction to Center College, um, but as uh, a bit of informative help and guidance about the college admission process uh, at this unusual time. Here in Danville, um, we're preparing for a 201st year at Center College like no other year in our history. We're inviting our students to return or to study remotely from home, their choice. Uh, and we've been working hard to make sure their experience is safe and high quality and personal, regardless of the choice they make. I'm sure you're preparing for a year of high school that is like no other any of us have seen. Uh, and if you're a senior, you get to figure out how to do a college search with campus visits, limited, standardized testing, compromised or impossible, and loads of disruption in the spring of your junior year. And uh, again, I'm betting this fall. We recognize that both the pandemic and our national reckoning with racial injustice have affected students in different and unequal ways. And um, they're affecting your movement through the admission process. We're here to help. All of the staff who are on this call are dedicated first as counselors to you through this experience. That is our role, not salespeople. We're here to help you make a good choice for yourself. We'll represent Center College well and accurately um, and try and help you discover uh, what the fit might be uh, between the experience we offer and the education you seek. And, uh, and we feel confident that that will bring many of you our way. Some of you it will take to other places and that's okay. If we've helped to you to come to the right decision, we will have done our job in the process. It's a personal process here at Center. Um, we will know you as people um, and we will respond to individual needs and circumstances. Um, you may have seen in the news uh, somewhere along the way, uh, a statement that was signed by several hundred chief admission officers at colleges across the country. Center was one of the signatories of that statement. Um, and I'd like to read to you a few of the principles that it describes so that you will know how we are approaching um, evaluating students in this challenging and different time. First principle is self-care. Self-care is really important in times of crisis. And we recognize that many students are just trying to get by. We encourage all of you to be gentle with yourself during this time. Second value, academic work. Your academic engagement continues to matter to us. But given the circumstances of many families, we recognize you may face obstacles to academic work. We'll assess your achievements in the context of these obstacles. Um, we will also assess them in the context of how your opportunities have changed or uh, been made different uh, during these times. Third principle, service and contributions to others. We value contributions you make to your community if you're in a position to provide those contributions. And we recognize that many students are not in this position because of stresses and demands. Four, family contributions. We understand that some of the most important work you can be doing during this time is supporting your family supervising younger siblings, for example, or caring for sick relatives, or working to provide income. 
we know these are important contributions and we will value them appropriately. And finally, extracurricular and summer activities. We are not going to disadvantage you uh, for opportunities you have not been able to take advantage of during this pandemic. We know that plans for summer opportunities have changed and been impacted, and we're not going to disadvantage you for that. We've always considered work and family responsibilities as valuable ways to spend your time, and that's especially true right now. So I, I hope that gives you some comfort um, as you imagine how college admission offices will evaluate you during this time. Um, we are mindful. Uh, we're all impacted by this as well, and we're living through many of the same changes as you are. Um, and we're committed to a process that puts you at the center. We'll have time for questions on more of this stuff uh, at the end of the program. Uh, so for now, I'd like to pass it to my colleague, Annie Murphy. Annie? It's like you're getting Thomas Becker, but close enough. Whoops. <laughs> hey folks, uh, my name is Thomas Becker. Um, I'm one of the admission counselors here at Center, um, and I am going to walk you through a little look at Center College. Um, this presentation is going to be short and very much adapted to our needs today to give you a broad brush overview of what to expect and a few things you can learn, but it's not everything you can know about Center. It's just almost everything. So without further ado, we're gonna dive right on in. So the first thing you should know about Center is that we are a small school. That small school environment uh, is something that we're really proud of. It's something that we're really intentional about growing and fostering in its own way. So that small school environment is going to be one that gets to know you as a person, not as a number, one that allows you to take advantage of tremendous opportunities, not only in getting to know your peers, but also in working with world-class academics and a phenomenal staff that's there to enrich your college experience as well. A little bit about those 1,400 or so students, we are roughly 50-50% um, folks who identify as male and folks who identify as female, especially among small liberal arts colleges. This is a bit of an exception where we're seeing much more uh, weight given toward female students. That percentage tends to be much higher. Here we try and keep that relatively balanced. We also uh, are very proud that our number of students who identify as students of color is right around a quarter of our student body with another 6% of students coming to center from abroad. We really value the global perspective that one can gain through an education and we also want the center community to look like the community that you are going to be entering one day. Um, and in that vein, our last number on here, 98% of students live on campus. This is tremendously important to us as a center community. Um, that sense of living together, working together, learning together, all of those things are happening in a very intentional community. Um, and we like for you to be with us all four years. Don't worry, your housing is guaranteed. Center students come from all over the country and all over the globe. Currently, we have 41 states and 14 countries represented. Um, we're about 50% Kentuckians, 50% non-Kentuckians. So while we are very much rooted in the bluegrass, we're a school with a national and an international reach. Uh, Center is renowned for its faculty. It's one of the things that if you read about us in different articles or lists, this is one of the things that pops up most frequently. The center faculty student relationship is very unique. It's something when I encountered it as a prospective student stood out to me, uh, even as I was looking at schools that kind of looked very much like Center College did. Our faculty not only are experts in their field, world-renowned academics and researchers, but they're folks who teach at Center College because they enjoy teaching undergraduate students. They could be at much larger universities doing very different things, but they're not. They're here at this place of high expectation and high achievement because they like working with students who have that capacity. So having this number small is something that we value. We want our faculty members to get to know our students, to engage with them in meaningful ways, and to provide a rigorous and rich academic experience. 
Your classroom is going to be an intimate environment. Uh, the average class size at center is 18, and we're going to cap all of those classes at 30. 60% of your classes will have 20 students or fewer, and especially as you get into your major area courses as a junior and as a senior, those course sizes are going to shrink. Um, we definitely value discussion and collaboration in the classroom. We have one giant lecture hall on campus, and you can expect for it to be never filled unless you're there for a guest lecturer. We don't hold classes where you are just a number. We hold classes where you are expected to be a contributor to an engaging conversation. This is a list of all of our academic programs here at the college. As you can see, it is a very wide array of majors, minors, pre-professional programs. We have a number of degree partnerships. And we also have Choose Your Own Adventure, the self-designed major. Um, the one thing I will mention in this, and all of this information is available on our website, so if you miss anything or as we're skating through things, I definitely encourage you to go back on the tail end and do a deep dive and feel free to contact any of us admission folk, we're happy to steer you in the right direction too, is about our pre-professional programs. That's the one thing I want to touch on. We do not have any pre-professional majors here at Center College. The way that our pre-professional programs will work is that you will pair any of those pre-professional programs with a pre-existing major. They don't necessarily have to be related, but they function as ways for you to track yourself uh, with coursework and with other experiences, whether it's research or relevant internship, that are gonna prepare you for advanced study in those areas. So I know folks who were pre-med students and music majors, folks who were pre-business and history majors, there's a lot of flexibility in a liberal arts education and center is really proud to be able to offer that and foster that and emphasize that that's a good thing you don't need to have everything matched up and squared away we want you to have a liberal education a broad one that takes advantage of all of the array of academic offerings that we have here at the college but we also expect that you're going to be involved and invested outside the classroom you'll be spending any number of hours in a uh, classroom setting, but you will be spending far more of them outside. So a lot of learning is going to happen outside the classroom. And a big way that that happens is through extracurricular activities. So we do have over 2000 events on campus each year. We have over 80 clubs and organizations. We are a campus on the go. Over 40% of our students are involved in the arts. Over 40% of our students are varsity athletes and over 80% of students are doing regular community service. So while there's no typical center student involvement where you could say, oh, everyone does this, the typical center student is involved. So I usually tell folks, if your dream college experience is to go to a giant lecture hall, to blend in a bit and go back to your room and heat up some instant noodles and call it a day, center is probably not gonna be the place for you. We want folks who are going to be really invested in their academic experience and really invested in their extracurricular experience as well. That's what's going to help build the whole person, someone who is prepared to go out for a life of learning and leadership and service. One of the things that Center is renowned for often in the same vein of those really awesome faculty relationships is our study abroad program. That's usually a frequent touch point for our school. We are consistently ranked among the best schools in the country, both in terms of our rate of participation and quality of our study abroad program. Over 80% of center students will study abroad at least once during their time with us, and over a third are going to study abroad twice or more. This is a tremendous percentage for a voluntary program. I think it speaks to the excitement that students have about learning and growing in a different place. And it also speaks to the value that our community places on global citizenship. So even if you're thinking, well, I'm not quite sure if I want to study abroad, it's always good to have the option. And you're gonna find yourself in a classroom environment surrounded by people who have. So you will have that broad perspective, that really awesome experience of taking your education in Danville, Kentucky out into the world. All of these countries you see highlighted here are places where we've had study abroad or study away programs here in the US. We are very proud to be able to get, guarantee 
something beyond a degree to our students. Uh, we call it the Center Commitment. It's been around for about 20 years and it has three parts. We guarantee that every student that wants one will have the opportunity to engage in a faculty mentored research project or an internship for academic credit. We also guarantee that you'll be able to study abroad for a semester, regardless of your course of study. And we guarantee that we can graduate you in four years with a degree. And if we fail to meet any of these three aspects and you meet all expectations of being a good student, passing your classes, being a good community member, not breaking major school rules, if we fail to deliver, your fifth year of tuition is on us. And we've never had to do that. Um, I would say that that speaks very well to Center's capacity to advise students well, to make sure they're taking advantage of opportunities but also center students who know about these things, who are really excited to be able to take advantage of a quality academic experience with a four year end date filled with awesome experiences, whether they are at a job site, whether they're doing awesome research or they're studying abroad. Center students come here, stay here, and are really glad they went here. Uh, the numbers that you see here reflect the highest numbers in the Commonwealth of Kentucky by miles and are among the best retention for your graduation rates in the country. And we support having the happiest alums in the country. Um, Center is a place filled with fiercely loyal alums. And we're very glad that that's a thing. Folks are very invested in their center education even after they leave. They're also very successful. About two thirds are gonna go straight into the workforce and about one third are gonna pursue advanced study right away. Another third are going to get another advanced degree at some point. Center is a place of lifelong learning and our success rate post-grad is indicative of that. We have three standard deadlines. These are all deadlines that you're gonna see at other schools that you may be looking at. They might, the dates might vary, but the verbiage will not. So early decision is binding. If you apply to a school early decision, you are only allowed to apply to that one school early decision. And if you are accepted, you enroll. Um, that's your way of saying, this is my first choice by a mile, and if you let me in, I'm coming. The other two options are non-binding. Um, they're your standard applications. The only difference is with early action, you get us your materials sooner, we get you a decision sooner. Um, but that's kind of how that breaks up there. So November 15th, December 1st, and January 15th. The last thing I'll touch on just briefly, and we might have some questions about this, and I'd also encourage you to reach out to your admission counselor if you have specific inquiries about financial aid, um, is Center is a school with a big price tag and a big ability to help bring that price tag down. Nine in 10 students are not paying our comprehensive fee. Um, the primary way that that comes down, that sticker shock price, is through scholarships. Center uh, is definitely a place that puts its money where its mouth is in terms of general merit scholarships, that first column. Uh, general merit scholarships are based on the quality of your application. You don't need to submit anything extra except your application. This column there in the middle, special scholarships, uh, the first two you'll see are performing arts and language. If you have a gift, talent, or passion for dramatic arts or music, which would require an audition, or any of those languages you see there, which would require an interview, definitely encourage you to apply for those. Those are two, and there are only two, stackable scholarships. So you can be awarded a general merit scholarship and one of those special scholarships as well. New Horizons and Bonner are other special scholarships that do not stack but would supersede any general merit that you're offered. And then we have three premier scholarship programs. These are programs, as you can see there on the right hand column, two of them do require a separate application. Two of them are full cost plus and one is full tuition plus. Um, these are very generous programs. They're also very competitive programs. Definitely encourage you to apply, talk through your application, talk uh, with your admission counselor, see if you'd be a good fit for those programs. But we would love to get your application for those as well. The average first year aid package is just shy of $32,000. And Center, like I said earlier, puts its money where its mouth is. We commit $37 million or so of our own funds to assisting in financial aid each year. Uh, and that number is consistently high, especially when we have something like a global pandemic happen. Um, Center's generosity and its want to meet students where it, they are uh, did not wane during this time. If anything, it grew. 
So um, we are very proud to be able to assist students in the way we are. And our financial aid process is pretty straightforward. We do need the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid, and the center aid form, which is a supplement that we have in-house. This is our little piece of home. We wish that we could be welcoming you to center right now, um, but we can't. But we hope that you have learned a little something here. Um, and I'm going to turn things over now to my colleague, Annie Murphy, um, and she's going to take us through an activity where you can learn a little bit more about our admission process in particular. So Annie, over to you. All right, thank you so much, Thomas. I really appreciate it. Um, hope you guys got a good introduction there to Center. Um, what I'm gonna do now is kind of take us in a little bit in a different direction. So one of the things that we said we would like to um, do today is to provide you with, yes, information about Center, but also information that we think can be helpful for you as you engage in the admission process in general. So what I'm gonna do is share my screen we are going to um, present a, a little activity or kind of um, simulation for you today okay so we're calling this the path to college admission or um, and we'll get into it here so um, what we're going to do throughout this um, activity is to really get to know um, some of the things um, that us as admission counselors are really looking at in college applications. So it, it seems a little bit like it's a mysterious process, but this is gonna hopefully give you um, kind of a, a peek behind the curtain. So we're gonna get started. Um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna meet some fictional applicants today. So. These are folks, you can see our, our friends down here at the bottom, um, little context for them. They are applicants that are coming from all kinds of different schools. Um, we pay attention to the context of each student in our application process. So um, you may go to a school that is, is rural or maybe it's urban or suburban. It might be a public school, it might be a private school. Um, we pay attention to that context. Um, and then what we'll see here below is you can see all of our students in um, ranked order of their GPA. So why did I include the GPA here? Um, it's the only kind of known piece of information that you're going to have in this process. Um, you know, in our schools, in our systems, we, we tend to really like assigning numbers to people. Um, now that I have done the work that I do for so many years, I realize that those numbers um, only tell us very little about an applicant. And so we're gonna get to know some of those other things that we would look at um, in the application. So um, often that other information is really what gives um, uh, us a better sense of, of really, are you a good fit? Are you a good match for our campus? So we'll get into it. Um, so first we're going to talk about high school coursework. Um, so some of these students um, who are lined up here today took really challenging courses in high school. They, um, it might be AP, IB, dual credit, it, it varies depending on what's offered at their school. Um, but some of these students, um, the main idea is that they have been taking things that were appropriately challenging for them, um, really engaging in that college prep coursework. So look at this, we've got three students who all get kind of a, a bonus here, a plus three in that process um, because of that, that coursework. We have another student um, here and she's involved in something we don't see every day. She is the director of the gospel choir at her church. Um, she's shown a lot of commitment there. And then there's another student here who has applied to our college early decision. Um, Thomas talked about that a bit in his presentation. So this early decision student um, has really kind of um, gone all in on our college. They've decided they've done their research and they say, hey, you know what? Um, if I'm admitted, this is really where I wanna be. Um, that really shows the college your, your real enthusiasm um, for the school. So a um, little bonus there. This other student, um, you know, unfortunately, this student um, gets a, a negative um, uh, one here in our simulation because they did not know any of their teachers well enough to ask for a recommendation. 
Um, so what that means for us is that we really missed out on getting to know um, what that student is like in the classroom setting. So here's a summary of what we've learned so far. Um, you know, you're definitely are seen in the context of your school. Um, and so um, lots of different things are valued in the process. So let's move on down the lane. We're gonna see where our students are now. You can see that they've been uh, kind of rearranged here. Um, and so we're gonna get to know some more things. All right, so two of these students Com, um, completed really significant community service during their time in high school. So this is kind of beyond maybe what might be required for say like NHS or kind of um, their school. They've really committed to a project um, and that's great. Um, one of these students is a varsity athlete at, at her school. Um, there she is. She, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of commitment to, to be a dedicated athlete. Um, and another one of these students is also a varsity athlete. She's also considering um, playing her sport in college. Um, and she is in active talks with our, um, uh, the coach on, on our campus. And we think that she could be a really great contributor to the school um, and also to a team. So there we go there. Um, then we have um, a student who unfortunately in her applications, um, she, she really kind of rushed through things. So what she did was when she applied, she um, uh, copied and pasted a bunch of text into several different applications and she forgot to change the name of the school when she was applying. Um, so, and, and that's of course, you know, we assume you're applying to lots of schools. That's, that's not the, um, the thing that matters here, but the, the problem is really more that she really could have taken greater care um, with her application. So, and then we have another student who, um, over here, who did not list, you can see here, she didn't list any activities on her application. No, no kind of involvement, no activities. It was just kind of a blank page. Um, and, and unfortunately, that, you know, that's really significant in our application process. Um, you know, one of the ways that we can see how a student might contribute on our campus is to look at how they've contributed on their own campus or in their own community. Um, and so that was something that we felt like, hmm, that might not be a great match. Um, please know, though, that I'm saying that um, absolutely understanding that, um, like Bob said earlier, we are dealing with a totally different um, context and situation right now. We understand, we appreciate that, that the normal activities, things that you loved might not, um, are, are not available to you right now. So that's absolutely gonna be taken into consideration in our process, so. We have another student here who was invited to do um, a virtual interview with their admission counselor. Admission counselor reached out, said, hey, I'd love to speak with you, get to know you a little bit better. And the student didn't respond. Um, so, and of course, we all know that you're very busy. Absolutely, um, no offense there. It's just, it was a missed opportunity. We would have liked to have gotten to know that student a little bit better. All right, and then um, we have a student here who, um, the essay, the essay kind of uh, for this student was, um, was pretty short, unfortunately. It was like one paragraph long. It was a little bit generic. We didn't really get to know any new information about that applicant. Um, it probably was rushed, maybe kind of done the night before, that sort of thing. Um, so that's something we learned about, about that student. So in summary, what did we learn here? Um, you know, we're looking for, for good campus community members. Um, of course, kind of pay attention to the details in the application process. You guys know that, um, but, but they matter in this context. Um, and uh, we'd love to get to know you. So let's see where our applicants are now as they have gone down um, the process here. Now they're in a totally different order. Um, and we're gonna learn a few more things too. So, um, one of the, um, the students here, um, from learning the ap reading applications, what we've learned is that two of these students um, are the first in their family to go to college. So they're first generation college students. 
we can see them right there. Um, so what that means is that, you know, they might not have had the same um, kind of help or guidance through this admission process that some of our applicants would. As an institution, we really value um, access to higher education. Um, and so, so we value our first gen applicants um, a lot. All right, then this next student that we have um, is a, uh, sorry, just a, sorry, this next applicant, um, oh, we have two of them here. So this, this student was an Eagle Scout, a Boy Scout and Eagle Scout achieved that honor. And this student is a Girl Scout uh, Gold Award recipient. So amazing job for both of them, love to see that. This is a student who, um, decided to her senior year protect her GPA. Um, she'd done really well. She'd gotten all A's and lots of really challenging classes. Um, but then senior year, her schedule, she kind of you know, dropped down several levels. Um, and so what we see there is a student who um, wasn't necessarily setting herself up um, for that kind of college prep coursework that she really was capable of. Um, and we wish we would have seen that. All right, this next student here, she has indicated on her application that she has a part-time job um, and that she also um, helps um, pay, pay bills for the family. She helps contribute financially in that way. And she's also helping with, um, with childcare for younger siblings. And so she's really um, doing a lot in, in her family. All right, so then we have a student here who unfortunately um, on his transcript, he, get, he got a D um, his sophomore year in math, in a core course. Um, so not a great grade, uh, it's a little bit worrisome, um, but, but what this student did was he used the application um, to tell us a little bit more about that, um, that grade that he wasn't necessarily proud of. Um, and what we learned is that he had mono that semester. And he just wasn't able to, he had so many absences, he couldn't necessarily master the content that he needed. Um, and so, you know, didn't do very well on the final. That's where that D came from. And so, you know what, hey, we've got hearts in our process. We get it. So let, let's give him a, a little bit more, more credit for that. So, all right. And then this last student over here, um, wow, this is one of those essays that really blew us away. We learned so much about the student's story. It was a very well-crafted essay. It, it was very well done um, and really um, helped that student kind of jump, jump off the page, if you will. So we love that application, that, that application essay. All right. So now let's see where everybody is. Um, we're going to kind of go check out. Oh, so um, it's a little bit of a summary there for you. Um, I, I do want to um, stress that um, also on the application, the common application coming up this year, there is going to be a section on the application where you can tell us um, kind of your, your COVID-19 story, kind of what happened, what changed with your school, with your learning. Um, so make sure that you, you take the opportunity to, to help us get some of that context for you. Um, because again, we really wanna go through this process with care and concern. Um, and so we'd love to hear, hear about that. All right, so here we are, the results. Where do you think folks are? So, um, so before I kind of put this up, you know, as I've gone through this presentation, I've lined folks up kind of in an order makes you, you maybe think, you know, hey, it's a top-down sort of um, approach to this admission process. But, but the truth is really is that students, their, their attributes, their accomplishments, their activities, their, the wonderful things that make them who they are, tend to kind of get you in a tier or in a group. Um, so we're going to kind of look at where these students landed. So here's our first group. Woohoo! Look at all those gold stars um, and green stars and blue stars. Um, so these are students who just really, they have so much um, um, about them that we think would be great on our campus. We'd be um, really excited to welcome them. So congrats to them. Then we have our second tier here. They're also just amazing students. We definitely think that they would bring a lot to our campus. 
Um, and then we have these students over here who are also have really great qualities, really great things. Um, and I think all of the applicants that we've had here today are applicants that many colleges would be really excited to welcome. So let's kind of get um, kind of to wrap it up a little bit. We'll, we'll get to our conclusion. So, you know, the, the idea of this admission process, there can be confusion, there can be um, concern as you approach this process, but the truth is um, there are so many colleges and universities out there who, who are excited to get to know their applicants. They want to get to know you. Um, the idea is if you've worked hard, if you have um, found some things that matter to you, if you have really um, you know, learned about yourself throughout your high school process, um, there are so many colleges who would be really eager to admit you. So, um, and then good luck to you guys as you embark on the process. I hope you learned something a little bit new um, from this presentation. Thanks a lot. And now I am going to give it over to my colleague, Anne. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for that, Annie. That was really fun to follow along. And um, that was the first virtual edition of that type of exercise anyone in our office has done. And um, again, I know I enjoyed following along and I hope that you all did too. Um, I am gonna move into our kind of essay focus of the day. Um, so I'm gonna also share my screen real quick. Here we go. And I'm going to come over here and hit present and we'll get started on this part. All right. So let me minimize the video. So we are focusing on essay writing and application tips and tricks. Um, we had a great kind of intro to the holistic review process via the activity that Annie just led us through. Um, and we'll kind of continue on with a little bit of a broad view. But then again, like I said, we'll focus in on the essay. All right. So. As Thomas mentioned in the uh, in his presentation, we do use the common application that is available as early as August 1st. And it is the type of thing where you can go in and you can work on it, save your progress, log out and come back to it. So um, as early as August 1st, you can jump in there and go ahead and start filling that out. If you're like me, you prefer to kind of get started on those things early. Um, and I know that we definitely recommend starting on those things early just because the fall will get rolling and time will fly by. Um, so August 1 is when it is officially available. We have three application deadlines at Center. And again, we do use the Common App and it is free to apply to Center. So we have early decision, that's November 15th deadline. That is for the student who knows 100% without a doubt that Center or whichever school they're applying to early decision is where they want to land. And we also have early action and regular decision. Both of those have different deadlines, but you simply need to let a school know by May 1st if you have um, landed on their schools where you'd like to go. Um, all right, let's consider the whole in holistic review. So we are one of the schools that practices a holistic review process, like I know we've touched on earlier today. Um, so just kind of quickly skimming the surface, we consider every single thing that a student submits with their college application. So everything that you input on the common application will come to us and we will see it and we will use that as part of our review process when reading your application. So that includes the rigor of coursework based on what's available at your school. That includes your GPA. It includes extracurricular and leadership commitments or personal commitments outside of school. Um, I know Annie mentioned in her activity that there was a student who had some at-home responsibilities and a part-time job. So that's the type of stuff that we want to see um, if you are already doing that. We want to see that included in your application so we know where your time is going. We're going to look at applicants within the context of their school. So um, one of the benefits of being a small liberal arts school is that we get to know our students really well and we also get to know the schools from which they apply pretty well. Um, so we have typically a pretty good pulse on what's available at different schools and um, you know 
what student government might look like at one school versus another, that kind of thing. We're going to look at your recommendation letters coming in from your teacher. We require at least one of those. We're also going to look at your test scores if you choose to submit them. Um, Center is now a test optional school, at least for the next three years. So if you choose to submit your ACT or SAT tests, um, we will look at them and use them only if it will benefit you. So let's say that your high school transcript includes your ACT or SAT scores on it, but you have told us that you do not want us to consider those scores, then we will ignore them. If you have told us that you want us to consider those scores, we will use them if they are going to benefit you. We will ignore them if we realize that they are not going to benefit you. Um, so it is totally your call. And then of course, yes, we are also going to consider your essay as part of that holistic review process. So does anyone even read the essay? Yes, we do. In fact, I think that the essay is a favorite part of the application review process um, for a lot of our counselors, if not all of our counselors in our office. I know it's definitely my favorite part of the application each year and it's kind of the thing that I really look forward to reading the most. Um, we are evaluating essays in a number of different ways. We're looking at um, you know, the writing strength of a student. That's kind of first and foremost, right? Are they weaving a narrative? Does it make sense? Um, is, do they have good grammar? You know, basically, have they proofread it? That kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of the main thing really that we're looking for is that nice, solid writing. Um, you have 500 to 650 words that you can use in there. And so we encourage you to use however much within that that you need to tell your story. We'll dig into this a little more as we go. Um, can a really good essay really make a difference? Absolutely. This is your opportunity to speak directly to admission committees and show us who you are and give us a little bit more um, more about you from what else your, excuse me, from what everything else that your application tells us. Um, this is the really like personalized view behind the curtain, so to speak. And what about a not so good one? Does that make a difference? Yeah, um, you know, if there's an essay that's really, really poorly written, that's gonna throw up some red flags for us and we might be a little hesitant or have some questions. Um, so the essay does matter. It's not the end all be all, but it does make a difference. All right, while we're on this topic, um, you don't wanna forget about all the other areas in your application where you're gonna be writing, right? So it's important that if you have this phenomenal essay, um, we hope that in your activities and personal commitment section of your application, you're also gonna go ahead and give us those complete sentences and expand upon your activities. Um, that, just seeing if that writing matches up, if that makes sense. But let's talk a little bit about this section of the common application. This is an area where you can include community service, you can include involvements at school, you can include any at-home responsibilities or part-time work, that type of thing. And every school has clubs that are often titled the same thing, but perhaps the commitment level or involvement looks different for each school. Um, so student government is, is a nice example. You can see on this screen the student um, lists that they were a house captain at their school and that they split students into five different houses. Um, so that gives us a little bit more context into um, kind of those extracurricular opportunities. So this is your chance to expand and tell us, you know, the level of commitment for those activities at your school and how, how big of a deal it is, right? I know my high school student government was huge um, and Beta Club was kind of, I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't as big of a time commitment necessarily. So this is your chance to expand in those areas. So this student has done a pretty good job kind of talking through the different things that they've been involved in. And let's go ahead and contrast that with this one. Um, so you can see the difference. For this one, a student has just kind of listed their involvements, but they haven't given us much context. Um, so again, that context piece is really, really helpful. Um, so we could have used a little bit more from this student. All right, what about supplemental or optional questions on the application? 
we encourage you to go ahead and answer the supplemental question that we offer on the Common App. And I imagine most schools, if they are offering supplemental questions, you would be encouraged to go ahead and respond. Um, so here for this one, our prompt on the Common App is briefly and specifically tell us why you have decided to apply to Center. Um, you can see that this student has thought pretty thoroughly about whether or not Center could be a good fit for them. They're talking about how the liberal, liberal arts base allows them to try on a lot of different academic areas, which is something they're looking for. They're mentioning study abroad and internship and research opportunities, that type of thing. So do go ahead and take advantage of that extra space to write a little bit and let us learn more about you and what you're looking for and how Center could fit in to what you're looking for. You also wanna consider your audience with the essay. So um, there's a wide range of people who might be reading your essay at any given institution. It might be someone who's close to your age. It might be someone who has been working in college admission for years and years, and so they've read a lot of essays. Um, you might have someone reading your essay who has the same political affiliation as you. Um, they might not have the same political affiliation as you. So when you're writing your essay, you wanna try to think about writing something that is true to you, but that also um, could be pretty easily consumed by a broad audience, right? So something to keep in mind. All right, so let's look at a few elements um, of a successful college application essay. So a successful essay is gonna help you round out your story. So again, you're gonna be wanting to think about the other application sections. For example, we're already gonna know a lot about your extracurriculars, so it's not necessarily a spot to sit and talk through all of the extracurricular activities that you're involved in, because we're gonna already see that. Um, you in the essay you'll want to show the committee what you might bring to campus so whether that's going to be your sense of humor the areas about about which you're passionate um, maybe you have a specific expertise in an area and you want to talk about that um, whatever it might be if it's something beyond what we're going to see elsewhere in your application you can totally write about it we want to hear about it um, and see again what you can contribute to center's community um, a successful col college application essay might reveal something that we might not otherwise learn, kind of tying back into that last point. We also want to make sure it's in your voice. Um, it's important to get someone to proofread your essay, but if you start bringing in five or six people for that proofreading process, um, you're probably going to lose your sense of voice in that essay. So you really kind of want to choose one, maybe two trusted mentors who can kind of walk you through any revisions um, or suggestions, right? Like revisions are always suggestions. You can take them or leave them however you wish. But the most important part is that your essay is in your voice um, and we get a really good sense of your tone. And then, like I said earlier, um, a successful essay demonstrates solid writing ability. So at the very minimum, it's a decent piece of writing where we can tell that you've spent some time and some intentionality um, with that essay. All right, a few things perhaps to avoid, or it's better if you don't regurgitate your resume. We've talked a bit about that. Um, it's better if you don't submit an academic essay from a class we can usually tell if a student has simply lifted an essay that they used for a class and dropped it into their application. Um, it typically feels just a little bit off, and so we, we try to recommend um, that folks avoid doing that. It's better if you don't take on a topic that's too big, right? Um, this can be challenging, because it can be hard to decide what to write on, but taking on a huge topic like world peace, or, um, well, that's a, that's a good example. You know what I mean, world peace. <laughs> Something huge where it's really not gonna be solved in 500 to 650 words, we recommend avoiding. Um, you probably wanna avoid the use of cliche metaphors and phrases. We kind of hear those a lot. Um, and again, we kind of lose your tone if you dive too deeply into those. 
don't go adjective crazy or wear out your thesaurus, that little thesaurus key in Microsoft Word. Um, it can be pretty obvious, again, when students are using words that they may not be comfortable with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, again, our goal is not to see how many fancy words you can use, um, but to really get a sense of who you are and what it is that you're interested in and how you can contribute to center. Don't try to be someone you're not. Um, and again, it's better to have someone you trust to proofread your essay. So don't, don't skip that piece. Um, okay, there's a few things that we read about a lot. Um, the sports essay, so how this sport shaped my life, the mission trip essay, um, how meaningful this was for me, starting with a quote, um, starting with a definition of something, all of these things are not off the table. So you can certainly write about any of these things, but we simply wanna be transparent and let you know that we get a lot of essays centered around all these topics on the screen. Um, and we predict some for about what I did during quarantine. And it just makes it tougher to stand out. So, but by all means, if you have something that you're passionate about that appears on the screen, you can totally write about it. But we just recommend spending even more time with that essay and really making sure that you stand out um, and that it's not something super, super cliche, if that makes sense. The hardship one that's up here, um, to give an example of that, we had a student one time who wrote an essay about um, failing her driver's permit and she had just been given a brand new car by her parents. And so her hardship was that she couldn't drive this brand new car because she had failed the test um, for her permit. So I understand where that kind of comes from, but it's also just doesn't quite fit the bill necessarily of a hardship. It just didn't quite land how, how it possibly could have. Um, and like I said, we predict that we're gonna get some essays around what I did during quarantine or the pandemic. Again, these are welcome, um, but we'll probably get a lot of them. So you'll wanna really try to like focus in and try to make it, um, make sure it's super specific to you. Um, and again, Annie mentioned that there is a spot on the Common App for this year that where students can go in and write about um, anything relating to the pandemic. So you can give us more context in that area as well. And your counselors, I believe, will also have the chance to do that in terms of um, how your school has adjusted. All right, so one tactic that we recommend is to think small and to really zoom in. So again, an essay is gonna be 500 to 650 words. Um, so one tactic that can be really successful is to focus on talking about a specific memory or one relationship or um, a day or a moment that was really impactful for you instead of trying to tell a really, really big story. So oftentimes um, the details and the way that you describe an event can tell us more about who you are and your perspective than trying to be too comprehensive in that essay. All right, and here are three examples of three different openers. Um, and you can probably tell which one is probably the strongest and which one might be the weakest, but we have living life unapologetically is easier said than done. And I should know, as I fail myself daily by, by means of one personal flaw I have spent years trying to correct, I say sorry too much. Okay, so that's a really, really good opener. Um, you can tell right off the bat kind of the tone that the student is taking on and they're zeroing in on one topic. In the middle we have, after years of searching, I've come to the conclusion that the meaning of life is to work hard and find happiness. Whoa, that's awesome. I mean, totally cool, rocking. A little bit of a big topic, the meaning of life. That's gonna be hard probably to focus in on in 500 to 650 words. And um, so it might just be a little bit weaker because it's such a big topic to wrestle with. And then we have kind of the basic intro. Hi, my name's Zach. I'm from New Jersey and I'm writing this essay so that I can get into college. This is kind of just fluff writing, right? Like this is, um, this isn't really giving us much information. We already have your name. We already know the state in which you live and clearly you're applying to colleges. So we're not learning anything new about this applicant in that opener. 
All right, so some tips for getting started, which is the hardest part. Um, you can go ahead and check out the Common App essay topics for this upcoming year. Um, and as I mentioned, as a few of us have mentioned, there's gonna be a section in the application this year devoted to sharing any information regarding the pandemic and how that has affected you. Um, but the essay topics are also already listed online. You can Google some brainstorming questions and just kind of get started with the writing process. Um, take, you can take a self inventory of what's important to you that could kind of help you narrow down what it is that you might want to write about. Um, I'm a big fan of free form writing and just not editing yourself or of like, oh, I'm blanking on what it's called, but I'm thinking of like word bubbles where you start with one idea in the middle and you can just chart out if you're pretty visual like me um, that type of kind of freeform writing can be really helpful um, the biggest well second biggest thing is to begin early so really just go ahead and begin as early as you can because the more time you have with something the more you're going to be able to finesse that essay and the more opportunities you're also going to have to get some feedback on that essay and you'll probably feel more comfortable with it if you don't do it the night before <laughs> so again don't do it the night before um, but the biggest thing is to have some fun with it again we just want to get a sense of who you are the essay is only a piece of the larger puzzle so there's not um you know it's not an end-all be-all type of thing by any means but um do have fun with it all right and if you all ever have any questions about um, the application process or essays you are welcome to email us or call us and i am going to bump over to my colleague gigi <laughs> Hello, I'm back. Um, thank you so much, Anne. That was great. Uh, I'm going to have actually the rest of my colleagues jump on so we can see you all. Go ahead and turn on your video. Look at those lovely faces. Um, so at this point, if you all in the audience want to um, switch to gallery view so you can see all of us at the same time, feel free to do so. Um, but we're going to answer any questions that you might have. So um, I just sent a reminder in the chat, feel free to throw your questions in there. Uh, but you can also email any of us. Uh, we have our emails on display. So we'd be happy to um, connect with you that way. So um, our first question in the chat is, um, where do we find the extra forms for financial aid and scholarships specific to center? Um, Thomas, do you wanna tackle that one since you sort of touched on that during the pre-tour? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And if it's okay, I'll even share my screen and show you exactly where on the website you can go to find that stuff. Okay. So if you go to the center website, which you should see over here, there's our new president, Dr. Moreland, what's up? <laughs> um, and you're going to go to this little apply bubble over here. And over here under cost and affordability, you have a ton of great resources. You're going to want to click on financial aid. And there are your two forms right there. So we have a couple great estimators as well. If you're curious about center's cost, um, I would definitely encourage you to check those out. You can Click on our estimate page here using any of our two estimators. One, my intuition is very brief. Six questions give you a quick and dirty estimate. Um, or the net price calculator, which is a bit more detailed, but gives you a better detailed estimate. So um, tons of great resources. I would just direct you so you'll be, do this again, center, apply, and then over here under apply cost and affordability, financial aid. Awesome. Um, and before we move on to the next questions, I'm actually going to have everyone introduce themselves. Um, so I know we have our emails in our, as our display name, but just say your name um, and we'll start with Clay. Hello everyone, my name is Clay Taylor and I'm an admission counselor. Um, I'm also a 2016 graduate from Center, so I'm very happy to be back at this place and excited to answer questions for you all. Glad you all are here. Awesome. Uh, we've already heard from Anne, so you guys know her. Lauren, go ahead. Hi, my name is Lauren Samuelson. I am a mission counselor as well. I'm also a 2016 graduate of Center. Um, I was an out-of-state student. I'm originally from Louisiana, but went to high school in South Florida before coming back or coming to Center. Um, and I'm just excited to answer some questions today. 
Awesome. We've heard from Thomas, so go ahead, Adriana. Hi, everybody. I'm Adriana, I'm Assistant Director for Diversity Recruitment in our office, also a center grad, originally from Los Angeles, um, and I'm happy to be here with you all. Very cool. Thank you, Adriana. And David? Hi, I am David DeWitt. Uh, I am also I, I'm a member of the admission staff. I'm also uh, a center graduate, but I graduated a long time before everybody else uh, that ha have you've heard speak. Uh, but really happy to, to have you join us today and hope we can shed some light on mysteries for you. Awesome, thank you. And we've also heard from our lovely Andy down there. Um, so uh, we'll move on to the next question here. Um, can we explain the binding and non-binding applications again? Sure. Um, and I see you nodding. So do you want to go ahead and explain that again? Yeah, totally. And I, I do realize, I think I kind of skimmed over that um, during the presentation, which I realized as I was doing it. So let me go into a little more detail. So um, a binding application decision process is where a student knows 100%, I absolutely want to apply to X school, in this case center, and if I am admitted, I will withdraw all my applications to all other schools. That's how serious I am about it. Um, typically, these students do have an estimate ahead of time on their financial aid package, so it's not like you're walking into something blind and signing on for something without any additional context. Um, but the only option that we have that is non-binding is our early decision option. That application deadline is November 15th. Um, you're typically going to be notified of admission in early January for that one. Um, the two non-binding options that we have are early action and regular decision. Both of those um, do not have that element of if I'm admitted, then I'm 100% going to attend. No. For those, you can apply to as many schools as you want under those application plans, um, and you have until May 1st to make your college decision. So no school should pressure you into saying yes or no at any point leading up to May 1st. You should have that full amount of time. Um, early action application deadline is December 1st. You're typically typically, excuse me, going to hear about admission in mid-January. Regular decision deadline is January 15th, and a student will typically hear about their admission notification in mid-March. Um, I did see one other question that just ties right in, so I'll go ahead and answer that. Typically, our financial aid notifications follow about a month-ish after an admission decision, maybe a month and a half. It just kind of depends on um, a number of different factors from year to year. Um, but we do not send the admission decision and the merit-based scholarship amount at the same time. The primary reason for that, as far as I understand it, is that we simply want to save our colleagues in financial aid um, some additional work if we can, right? So. Um, they will only read and make financial aid packages for students whom we have already admitted. So that way they're not spending their super valuable time working on any financial aid packages for students um, for whom center really may not be the best fit um, and perhaps who are, who are not admitted, um, if that makes sense. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, these two questions sort of tie into each other or sort of related. Um, Will not, so if a student does not submit their test scores, will that affect their financial aid package? Um, and with the pandemic and all the new changes, you know, this is a new process for us as well, but um, how will choosing to apply test optional affect scholarships? Um, and I see Adriana and Thomas both nodding, so I'll let you guys sort of tackle those two questions. Adriana, go ahead. Sure, happy to. And Thomas, please feel free to fill in any gaps that I have. But um, yeah, sending or not sending your test scores will not affect your financial aid award. We really have gone test optional um, 
for a reason in that we want students to be able to put their best foot forward within the application process. Um, for some students, they might feel like a test is able to do that for them. For some students, they might feel like they aren't. Given the pandemic, lots of students just haven't been able to take those tests. And so a test score is not really going to affect your access to financial aid or scholarships. None of our scholarships have um, a test score requirement to them. And so you are able to apply to as many or be considered for as many as you would like to just based off of your common application and then if you're applying to a special premier scholarship based off of the application for that specific scholarship but again um, none of those decisions are just based off of a test score for all of our processes for both admission and for scholarship and then for financial aid as well we really are taking a holistic view of the student's entire application so all of those things that Annie was mentioning in her presentation are taken into account when we're making decisions on scholarship and aid. Um, Thomas, anything you would add? Yeah, ditto completely. I'd, I'd say that the easiest way to synthesize it um, so that folks can remember it is that submitting or not submitting your test scores will never hurt you in our process. And if you submit them, they may help you but will it, like Anne and Annie said, we will ignore them if they're not going to help your application. We are going to do the work on our end to assist in helping you put your best foot forward. Um, so even if you're a little bit hesitant, it's completely your decision. You're not gonna be negatively impacted in any shape, form, or fashion, whether you choose to submit them or not. Um, and, and if you choose to submit them, we're gonna make sure it doesn't hurt you anyway. So um, just that little tidbit to keep in mind, but none of that is gonna be tied to your financial aid or your scholarship consideration. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for tackling that one. Um, Clay, do you have something to add? Yeah, um, I saw a question come up in the chat box about the language scholarships. I figured might as well keep on the trend of scholarships. Um, the language scholarship actually does not help pay for like any specific classes. It actually is an addition to the financial aid package. So it is just, it's an additional monetary offering for you. And um, that does tie in some, some class requirements as far as in the um, language realm. So you do have to um, take the required classes in your subject that you would prefer and then some outside languages as well um, as far as the essay it is in the language of your preference and your interview may be in the language of preference as well but if you just have a clear demonstrated interest and the professors will understand and they'll work through you through the process as well and um, you don't have to major or minor in a specific language language either it's open for everyone to take advantage of and one of the best um, benefits of this language is, is that it basically secures a study abroad trip and um, that is a requirement for um, achieving the language scholarship. So you may be able to travel abroad in the language of your target language or in a language that um, you took on in addition to your target language. So it is a pretty flexible scholarship to take advantage of. Awesome. Thank you um, for keeping an eye on those questions coming in. Um, this next question, I think I'm going to kick to David. As he pointed out earlier, he graduated from Center as well, but also has the most experience, so has seen um, the most um, financial aid packages, I guess, amongst all of us. So this question asks, how often is Center able to meet the full demonstrated need of a student? And I, uh... I, I don't know that I can give you a direct answer, like a percentage answer to that question. Um, we very often do meet full demonstrated need, but not always. Um, it's like, uh, like a family, uh, a college uh, scholarship and financial aid office is trying to uh, distribute those resources as equitably as possible uh, across uh, a, a wide array. Uh, of uh, of needs, um, so we're we're trying to put the, together the best financial aid package for every student uh, that applies and is admitted to the college. Um, the uh, the greater the need, the harder it is to meet that need. Uh, but we're we're committed to putting together the best aid awards we can. We'll draw on federal and state resources when that's appropriate. Uh, but the bulk of financial assistance that our students receive actually comes from the college itself. 
Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's a sufficient answer or not, because um, um, I really don't know a, a percentage in terms of, of how often we can, can meet demonstrated need. Um, we, we frequently do, but we don't all, it doesn't always work out that way. Awesome, thank you. Um, this next question asks, if I apply early action, when should I know if I got in? Um, by mid-January, that is, um, if you apply by the early action deadline, you should know by mid-January about your admission. Um, I'm gonna kick this one over to Annie. So does the does center provide the opportunity of working while um, studying for international students? Yeah, for international students, um, we do have some limited work study provisions. So yes, um, it's not necessarily um, every international student, but yes, we do have those opportunities. Um, as an international student, you do have some limitations on, on where you're able to work, so we would help you find a campus job. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let's see. So this next question is about um, AP and dual credit credits at center. So do we accept them? Um, there's also another question about accepting threes for AP tests. Um, so Annie, do you want to tackle this one? Uh, yeah, we, we kind of addressed this a little bit in the chat. There is a link there if you want to see a comprehensive listing of AP courses. Um, the general answer is that fours and fives on APs, AP exams will earn you credit. Um, dual credit, um, not so much. Our, our um, Dual credit is done differently in every school district, in every state of the United States. So it's, it's really difficult for us sometimes to kind of assess um, what that dual credit course is looking like. But if you have questions about dual credit, definitely reach out to, um, to your counselor um, because in some, in some instances, if it's taken you know, with college professors, with other college students, we can definitely um, uh, consider that. So um, was there one other question about that that I... Can can I jump in for just a second on the, the dual credit thing? Because over the years, I've discovered uh, there, there are a number of colleges, if you ask the question, will you accept the dual credit courses I've taken in high school, um, a number of college admission offices will immediately say, yes, we'll accept those credits. Um, but there's, there, you should ask more questions because often, um, even though they will accept the credit, if the credits, if the courses you've taken in a dual credit fashion don't uh, fulfill specific requirements uh, in that college's general education uh, course load or for particular degree programs, the it's it's sort of elective credit, and it, it if your goal is to speed yourself toward graduation, to shorten the amount of time you're attending college and you're thinking, well, I'll amass these dual credit courses and then I'll graduate in three years versus four years. That is, that's pretty rare and that, you, that typically doesn't happen at most places even when they tell you we will accept your dual credit courses. So it, it's worth asking if your goal is to graduate early, you need to specifically ask about that and dig a little deeper when you talk to admission folks. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no need to apologize. Thank you. Um, so this next question asks about pre-med or, or a pre-professional sort of track. Um, so what would you guys say um, are the advantages of studying pre-med or any other pre-professional track at a small liberal arts school like Center um, as opposed to a larger research university? Annie? <laughs> I'll chime in on that one. Um, we. That's such a great question, and we get that a lot. Um, we've actually done a couple of um, uh, presentations that are recorded on our website, and if somebody could find a YouTube link and pop that into the chat, that would be amazing. But, um, you know, my take on it, um, our take, I guess, I guess I can speak for us, um, is that, um, you know, studying for something like, um, a career in medicine, a career in business, a career in, you know, well, really any kind of professional setting, um, getting your, your start at a place like center um, is going to mean that you're not actually going to be a specialist in that thing from day one. You are going to get a really well-rounded 
base, academic base, um, skills base, um, that will then transition into your chosen profession um, in a way that's going to give you, um, we think, more adaptability, more flexibility, and um, and just be kind of a better a better, uh, can be a better approach. Um, the other benefit that you're gonna have are just small class sizes. So when you are trying to master really tough content, like organic chemistry, for example, um, to be able to do that in a small class setting where there are say 15 people in your course, really, really close um, connections with your professors, um, we think that can lead to, to really good results and better better mastery of those things. So, um, but again, check out those panel discussions that we have on YouTube. Um, that could could be helpful for you. I think you get to meet some students there too. Can can I chime in on this one too? Of course. This is this will be quick though. We had a um, a faculty member who was the pre med advisor, pre medical school advisor here for a very long time, and he would always tell students that if if your goal is to get admitted to medical school, go to a big state university and get a 4.0. If your goal is to be the best doctor or physician that you can possibly be, come to a place like this and take advantage of all the different opportunities you have in a small setting. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Um, this next question touches on sort of student life. Um, so what's the LG BT plus life like on campus? Is there a presence or a GSA club or something like that? Adriana? Yeah, um, I guess specifically to your question, we certainly have, um, you know, a presence of the LGBTQIA plus community on campus. Um, we do have a GSA. Um, we also, I think this next year will be the third year of a living learning community called Community, which is really fun and students can elect um, to live within that um, learning community if they would like to. It's kind of a dedicated residential space. Um, but just in general, we do have a number of student organizations or student affinity groups on campus. Um, and I think those are really good for our students. I think it provides a safe space for students. I think that um, students get to form community with other folks that they identify with, whether it's um, you know, racial, ethnic, whether you're first gen, I mean, really a number of things. Um, and I would say those clubs are really active, like folks said, or like Thomas said, really, in his pre tour presentation, students on campus really like to be involved. And so participation in these kinds of clubs on campus is super common, and they get funding to be able to do a lot for themselves, but also to contribute to larger kind of education in our community and, and to provide really great space on campus. So, so definitely. Awesome. Thank you very much, Adriana. Um, I'm going to try to combine sort of three or four questions here. Um, so what's our biggest factor in consideration for general merit scholarships? So they list test scores, GPA, essay, letters of recommendation. Um, do we take into account whether the student is in state or out of state? And do we prefer to meet the students before offering merit awards? Um, and then we got another question that asks about um, how will students be able to get interviews from center? Um, so Lauren, do you want to try to tackle um, all of the things I just said? <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to. Um, the answer is there's just we do take all the factors into consideration and there's not really one thing that we look at. Um, I think that's my favorite part of our admission process is that we really get to take the time to get to know you as a student um, and to know your story. I know that's one of my favorite parts of being an admission counselor is you really get to sit down and get to know a student when you're reading all the things that they turn in. So there's not one biggest factor. Um, so I, that doesn't really answer your question, but it does in the fact that they all matter and they all, all of those things are very important for us getting to know you. Um, you coming from in-state or out-of-state is going to matter because that's part of your story and where you're coming from. I know Thomas touched on this, but we are 50% in-state, 50% out-of-state. Um, and so it will matter to our class and to who's coming in. And um, it'll help us get to know you better as a student and what you can bring to center. So that's definitely going to matter as well. Um, we, I mean, we, it doesn't really matter if we've met you or not before, before offering merit awards. Um, interviews are an optional part of our admission process. Of course, we'd love to get to know you before we read your application, but it's not gonna hurt you if we haven't. Um, I know I came from out of state and applied before I had done an official interview. 
But I do think one bright spot of the current pandemic and where we are right now is that we're going to get to meet a lot of students where they are this fall. And so we are going to be offering Zoom interviews, Zoom chats. Um, interview sounds very formal, but they're more of just to get to know you, a check in. Um, and I'm excited that we're going to get to offer even more of those to students wherever they are, all over the country and all over the world. So um, I do think it'd be great to reach out to schedule either an interview or a chat with your admission counselor, either before or after you apply definitely before the deadline of your application and just so we can get to know you better and I think those will be really fun so I'm excited about those. Yes for sure. Uh, Thomas go ahead. So the thing I'll add to that is you can do that now. You don't need to wait for us to say like hey like will you please you know let us know when you're scheduling times. Um, email us now if you want to have a conversation with any of us. Um, we're more than happy to get to know you. We want to get to know you. Um, and if not, like Lauren said, right, like you're not going to be hurt in the process by not, but if you're really eager um, to get to know us and for us to get to know you, we're happy to have that conversation anytime. Um, so email us with some times that work for you and we'll find a way to make that conversation happen. So don't, don't wait until the last minute, like Ann said, um, get on it ahead of time. Awesome. Um, this next question relates to GSP at Center. Um, so is there any benefit to um, GSP and when applying to center, being a GSP scholar and then applying to center? Andy? Sure, um, and I'm actually just putting something in the chat um, at you, Tazim, there. Um, so um, what we have for governor scholars and actually any, so if you are um, from out of state, just a brief explanation, the, the state of Kentucky has um, actually three different governor schools um, that are competitive to get into um, the Governor Scholars Program, the Governor School for the Arts, and the Governor School of Entre um, for Entrepreneurs. Um, what we have, um, we have kind of a guaranteed minimum scholarship for students who have completed those programs and also meet a couple of other criteria. Um, and you can find, um, find that on that link that I just sent. Scroll down just a bit. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm excited to hear the answers for this question. I think I'm going to have everyone or whoever wants to sort of chime in here, but um, what are some cool traditions that occur at Center? <laughs> so many to choose from. I know. <laughs> I'll start off with one. We probably talked a little about, about this during Thomas's presentation. Um, I love center term, which is our January term where all of our students only take one class. Um, usually those classes are really unique and fun and quirky and you can go abroad. Um, I know I took quantum American history, history of food and the art of walking. Um, I was a history major, just a spoiler there. <laughs> um, but I just love the spirit of January and it's just such a fun time on campus and it's something I'll never forget for sure. Awesome. Um, Clay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, another great tradition is the honor walk. Um, that's something that really ties the whole center experience together in and of itself. Um, as a first year, you start off at the seal, which is in front of Old Center. It's our oldest building on campus. It's where the main college was housed when we first started in 1819. And um, it has the seal, it has our um, School motto, Doctrina Lux Mentis, which means learning is a lot of mine. So your first year, you start there, um, you walk across it. To, well, you don't step on it. That's another thing. You do not step on the seal. Someone else can touch on that, but I'm touch on the um, honor walk. <laughs> but um, you do not step on the seal. And um, you usually go to the president's house, and they host a nice dinner for all the first-year students. But during your senior year, you're given a token in which um, you give it to someone who's made a big impact on your center experience. So it could be a professor, it could be your parents, it can be your siblings, it could be your best friend, it can be anybody who made a big impact. And you end at that spot and you give the token to that person who had that influence on you. So it really is a full circle experience. And um, I'm getting cultural, so just thinking about it. My sister gave me her token and um, it was a great experience and it was awesome i did not expect that to happen but um it was really awesome and um again it's just a great experience to um show the sense of community that center has on students awesome annie um one of my favorites is that um 
during during finals, which are historically a very stressful time, and and you've got a lot going on. Uh, we have several different traditions um, that kind of help students deal with um, that that time. So we have things like. Um, Massages, sometimes we'll have people come in and, and help. We have, sometimes the Humane Society will have puppies that will come to campus during finals week. And so as a huge dog person, I'm down with that. Um, and also a wonderful one is that professors, there will be one night um, where Cowan, our dining hall is open late and your professors, who are likely some of the people who are going to be administering your exams the next day will be serving you food like late night breakfast food um, and so I think to me it's a great indication of kind of um, the, the kind of fun um, and support that we put in um, even in some stressful more stressful times so. awesome thank oh. you David did you have something are, to are, are we going to talk about the flame or not are we gonna <laughs> question so is are you going to talk about it Oh, probably since, since, yes. since you brought it up. <laughs> uh, well, there there is a sculpture on our campus referred to as the flame, and it does resemble fire. Uh, and it's actually represents the three different academic divisions of the college. Um, but a tradition sprang up uh, a long time ago uh, where students would, it was sort of a rite of passage uh, if you were a student to to run around the flame uh, in a state of, uh, of unclothedness. Um, so, uh, I think, um, a lot more students claim to have run, run the flame is the phrase. A lot more students claim to have done that than I think actually have, but it's a thing. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a couple more. So, I see a question about um, playing a sport at center um, and given the pandemic, everything or most things have been canceled like tournaments and things like that. Um, but the student still wants to show that they're preparing for the college sport or being a college athlete. So um, how was sort of the recruitment process change? Um, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, we're trying to be as sensitive to that as possible and know that we want to work with you where you're at. Um, what I would recommend is just making contact with our coaches on campus and definitely reach out to your counselor too. We want to help you get connected with our staff. Um, we have questionnaires on our athletic page, but also feel free to email your counselor in our office and we're happy to connect you with our coaches on campus. I know that they're doing everything possible to stay connected with their students too, but um, we're all just doing the best we can. But always feel free to send some emails, call us, we're happy to get you connected and we want to work with you as much as possible. Awesome, thank you. Um, what percent of students are in Greek life? Do they have separate living quarters? Good question. Thomas? Yeah, so um, any given year we're about 45% Greek. Uh, you could say 50-50 for the sake of just easy split. Um, but that 50% doesn't happen until the spring semester of the year. Um, we have a delayed recruitment process, which gives all first years the opportunity to come on campus, get to know all of our student organizations and find the ways that they might want to be involved and invested. Um, the thing about Center's Greek life community that is rather distinctive among schools that look like Center is that it is a radically inclusive one. Um, there are very, very few events. I mean, I, I think only date parties are the only things that are kind of closed within the organization. But when it comes to house parties, community service events, philanthropy endeavors, all of those are open to the entire campus community. Um, so there's a lot of buy-in in, in that respect. I would also say that because you have that about five month delay from the time that you arrive on campus to the time where you might rush a Greek organization, you're gonna have friends and colleagues within the center community who are Greek and friends who aren't, whether you choose to rush or not. Um, that was true for me. Um, I was a member of Greek life at center and I didn't feel like it stunted my friend group or societal development outside of that. And my friends who weren't Greek felt very much the same way. Um, so I think that there's a really healthy collegiality around it in that respect. In terms of housing, 
the houses will only provide rooms for 10 to 12 members of each organization. So the rest are in housing all around campus, just like everyone else. But the ones who actually live in the house, um, it's just like another dorm, pretty much. It's a standard two bedroom deal. There's um, a shared bathroom and a kitchen facility and a living room, uh, and it's all college owned. So this is nothing that's happening off campus. These are college owned, college managed houses um, that are right at the end of the road, you know, right on campus. So very much integrated into the center community. It's not something that exists separately or something that exists as an extra. Um, it's something that's definitely woven into the fabric of the place. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, one student is interested in both business and film, um, but they want to know if it would be a sort of waste of time to major in film. Uh, Clay, and then we'll go to Anne. Um, I kind of touched on that in the group, but um, it is a great question. It is a great topic to talk about. Um, Center is open for you to take advantage of whatever learning opportunity you want to take advantage of. So um, I think something that's really interesting is that we've had history majors go on to dentistry schools, so two completely opposite fields, but that can happen um, because of the pre-dentistry track and professional program that we have. So you're able to juggle a lot of different topics while you're a student here. And something that is really been official um, is that you don't decide on the major until your sophomore spring semester so you can explore all the fields of um, academic opportunities that we have so you can find that path that you want to go down and then make that solidified decision going into your um, junior year so um, yes you can minor and major in whatever topics that you are interested in and it is an easy balance awesome and yeah, I'll just add to that. I don't think that any class, um, no matter what it is at center, is going to be a waste. All of it will be helpful things that, believe it or not, will tie in across across curriculums. Um, so, I mean, I, I know I dropped in the chat um, a link to one of our faculty Fridays with the director of the film studies program. Um, and Stacy Peebles is awesome, Dr. Peebles. Um, so check out that talk if you have the time. We do have a ton of different videos on YouTube and we've tried to organize them into different playlists. So we have faculty Fridays where we're interviewing faculty members. We have seminars focused on certain topics. We have um, different videos touring campus. So there are three different residence hall tours in there. There's a general campus tour. There's facility specific tour, athletic field tours. Um, so if you get the chance and you want to poke around on YouTube, please just go to the Center College YouTube page and check it out. And you can, um, a lot of the videos are the kind where you can click on the video and you can drag it. And so you can look around in like a 360 view. Um, so it's our, our goal and hope is that those will be helpful, um, especially for folks who are far away um, or unable to travel right now. So um, do check those out. But the, the conversations with faculty members and panels about specific areas, whether it's film studies or med school and the liberal arts or fill in the blank can be really, really helpful. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, so thank you all to our audience um, for asking such thoughtful questions. And thank you to my colleagues for giving such thoughtful answers. You guys are awesome. Um, I'll now pass it over to Pam Boffman, who will close us out for the day. Pam, Great. take it away. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'd first like to thank Gianna for creating this program today and also thank you to my colleagues for sharing their thoughts and expertise. This is a wonderful collection of professionals eager to be helpful, so be sure and reach out as you are inclined. Also, we're grateful for Barb's participation this afternoon, so I want to be sure and thank her. My name is Pam Boffman and I have the good fortune to serve as the Director of Admission here at Center a place where lifelong learning, civic involvement, global citizenship, compassion, and service to others are highly valued and nurtured. I am also a proud Center alum and a parent of a recent Center graduate and a rising sophomore. Like Clay, my favorite Center tradition is the Honor Walk, even more so now that my oldest son, uh, he honored me with his gratitude in a home quarantined 
on her walk this spring. So um, it was a special way for our family to celebrate his center career for sure. So there's no doubt we're experiencing trying times, but these challenges also allow for growth and development of creativity, innovation, and more intentional efforts of care and concern. I hope that you found today's session to be helpful and a nice introduction to Center, a community of students, faculty, staff, and administrators fully invested in a high caliber collaborative educational experience a kind of experience which is so critical and designed to prepare young leaders to respond to and flourish in a very complex and ever evolving world. I think we know now how critical it really is. Our goal is to build a partnership with you and your family, allowing us to navigate these uncertain times together. The college process is exciting and your participation today demonstrates your commitment to your education. So to further assist you, we have a number of daily virtual sessions lined up through mid-August. And as my colleagues mentioned, remote interviews are certainly available and we'd love to connect with you at your convenience. We will be transitioning to some fall programming very soon and we will certainly share those details in the coming weeks. If you are interested in scheduling a, an in-person campus tour, you can find those details regarding registration and our safety expectations online and we'll be updating all of this information as appropriate. Also, we're pleased that the updated version of Common Application will be available for students in early to mid-August. Center is a Common Application exclusive institution and we look forward to learning more about you through the application process. We welcome any questions you have and um, I think we're gonna post a slide in a minute giving you easy access so you know how to reach us. Thank you again for giving us your Saturday afternoon. We wish you and your family good health, much happiness, and have a great day.